Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Gloria Zwaravanu, the Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe. Enjoy this truly quality conversation. Gloria Zwaravanu, uh, apologies, I can never pronounce ZVA, I, I keep on trying. Um, Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of uh, Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. I feel very honored to be here. I'm a keen follower of your conversation, so it's, it's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the support, uh, Gloria. Gloria, I want us to start with some heavy lifting stuff um, relating to the state of the accounting profession. What's the state of the accounting profession at the moment? Okay, Trevor, I am, you know, for over the past two or three years, uh, we've been battling with uh, qualified opinions, mm. if I can put it that way. And uh, the reason for those qualified opinions is because of certain things that are happening in our economy that are not well aligned to the international financial reporting standards. Mm. So this country, in terms of standards, according to the Public Accountants and Auditors Board, we are supposed to adhere to international financial reporting standards. Mm -hmm. So when auditors audit, they audit against that standard yeah. that was set for us. And so one of the key standards, or one of the key standards that we have not been adhering to is the one relating to uh, 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 foreign exchange rates. It's called IS-21. Uh, because we've got an official uh, exchange rates and we also got alternative exchange rates and people get this monies from the two different uh, markets it's very difficult now it's reporting to be to be fully compliant depending on which market you were obtaining your your funds from so as a result most organizations got their financials qualified on is21 mm. Then we also have IS-29, which is inflation, you know, accounting. And, uh, you know, most, most companies do, you know, adhere to inflation accounting, but a few uh, have had some challenges, which are also linked to the uh, IS-21, which is the foreign exchange uh, standard. So because of that, the complications that arise from those two standards saw a lot of the organizations, if not all, except those that have their functional currency as the United States dollars, because then they don't have to battle with an exchange rate and converting. So that is the main challenge that we've been facing on reporting. Hyperinflation accounting in itself comes with a lot of work. You know, you do a lot of work to produce a different, a separate set of accounts which are hyperinflated. And when you really look at it, it's productive time that is being spent, uh, you know, to do the work double um, historical financials and then inflation adjusted accounts. But because we're in hyperinflation, we have to do that mm -hmm. so that we comply with the international financial reporting standards. Mm -hmm. What's the impact of uh, the qualification of uh, the accounts to, to the client? Okay, so the, the beauty about a qualification is that there is also an opinion paragraph where it states exactly where you're not adhering. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, your accounts are totally disregarded. It simply means that you didn't comply to a particular aspect. So if you go to the basis of opinion, you'll then be able to see what exactly it is that one is not, you know, adhered to. Mm -hmm. And a reader of financial statements will then be able to make their own judgment as to you know the basis of opinion and they see whether or not they can rely on certain things in the, in the set of financials but what is important is for as long as these financials are being checked against the international financial reporting so they're comparable so someone who picks it from the uk or from south africa can compare because they know it's the same standard that has been applied except this particular aspect mm. was not adhered mm. to so they are not you know they are not rendered useless uh, but it just provides information so someone knows exactly what particular aspect is not complied with. And the cost of uh, hyperinflation accounting to the client and to, 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 to the audit firms, talk, talk to me about that. 
Yeah. So first time adop adoption, like when we did the 2020 um, uh, financials, 2019 rather, I think that's when we first adopted hyperinflation. Uh, the time that it takes to train the people that actually do the, the, the hyperinflation accounts and the time that the auditors take to check is, is long. So it tends to lengthen the audit process. And the Natu fees, of course. Naturally, the yeah. fees will mm. increase. And also, you would find that most corporates didn't actually have uh, you know, accountants within their system who had actually done hyperinflation before. Mm. I mean, it's not, it's not really taught you know, uh, to a great extent. And we last had it, fortunately, we've, I don't know if I should call it fortunate because it's rather an unfortunate thing sure. to be in hyperinflation, but we've had it before, uh, back in 2006, 2007. So there were certain accountants who had done this before, but come, this, is, uh, this was now uh, 15 years later or so, and most of those accountants were no longer doing those mm -hmm. kinds of works. Mm -hmm. It was the newer accountants who had never seen this thing, mm -hmm. they'd never lent it. So the time that it took then for training and you know just for them to get uh, the hang of it but in the, this year i think it was definitely much easier because once you have the models mm -hmm. it's easier so it then tends to you know get less time and probably less cost as well mm -hmm. so like i said you are the the chief executive officer of uh, the institute of chartered accountants of zimbabwe we you've spent 18 years uh in in financial management uh, 14, year, 14 of those, I think, uh, at executive uh, management level. And um, your career starts with uh, KPMG, and then you go to First Mutual, Nicole's Diamond. And um, I, I want to ask you, what, as far as these places that you've been to, which one impacted on you the most? And on recollection, when you look at back, which one did you impact on the most? Right. As far as impacting me, Trevor, I think all of them had mm. some impact on me. Mm. Uh, KPMG, I was still very young. I was just coming out of school. This was my first job. And um, when you're auditing, you're going into clients and you're going into the big offices. Uh, you're going to, you know, see the chief executive and you're just a young, you know, girl who's just come out of, of, of university. What it gave me was confidence that you can actually knock on any door wow. and you can get your answers. That when you're there, you, it's, you're not Gloria, but you have the power of being the auditor. Mm. So you can come to Trevor and ask Trevor questions and Trevor must give you the answers. Mm. So that gave me a lot of confidence that there's no door that I shouldn't be able mm. to knock and there's no person that I shouldn't be able to have a conversation or ask questions. Mm. So that was KPMG. And then I moved into um, First Mutual now I was out of a professional setup, straight into you know into mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in in the profession you're protected. You know, all the professional values adhered to. Uh, and then when you go into industry, it's a different into environment. the real world. Into the real world, it's a different environment. Yeah. You have different professions in, in insurance. There's actuaries there, and you've got other you know professions uh, which 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 you know uh, you have to start to relate to, uh, with. So I think that environment was really a growth environment for me. Just uh, getting to know the real life, getting to know uh, how to cooperate and how to, you know, interact with others that are not necessarily from the same profession as you mm -hmm. and understanding the business as well, um, because you cannot account for something that you really don't know. So that gave me that sort of growth. And, and, and within a year, so I started off as the group finance manager of the group. And within a year, I was then promoted to be the finance executive or finance director of the biggest of their biggest subsidiary. Mm. So that in itself, um, you know, was a huge, huge um, thing for me. But it also meant that it came with a lot of growth because I had to quickly, quickly grow because I was only 27. And there I was heading FD of, uh, you know, a life assurance company and I had to grow. You must have been one of the youngest uh, FDs in the country, hey? I think so. Mm. I must have been the youngest. And I think at that time, everywhere that I went, I was always the youngest. It right. was always the youngest, uh, this, the youngest, that, and so on. But there was a lot of growth that happened there. There was also a lot of faith that was placed in me mm. uh, because here I was very young and uh, they saw something and they put their faith in me and they put me in that position. So I learned about, you know, just giving others a chance. I learned that uh, sometimes you don't need to find someone who's got experience um, 
you know, into those positions, but you need to look at potential. Mm -hmm. And so even for my own uh, journey, when I look at, uh, you know, uh, getting people into positions, I always think about how somebody else had faith in me uh, when I didn't have much experience. And, and I always, you know, give people benefit of doubt and, and, and allow them to be who they are mm -hmm. for as long as the potential is shown. Mm -hmm. And, and then, then Nicole's Diamond? Nicole's Diamond was when I, where I spent most of my time. And uh, I went into general management, so it was no longer just finance. I was now responsible for ICT, for human resources, for treasury, for administration. So I grew. I literally grew. I, this is where I think I was groomed into leadership. Mm. And working with someone like Grace Muradzikwa was such an amazing opportunity for me because she would really let the light shine on you. She would give you the opportunity to be who you are and grow as much as you can. Mm. So that environment at Nicholas Diamond really made me the leader that I'm in. What, what, what is it that Grace taught you? So Grace, I saw. It was not so much what was taught to me um, or what was said to me or what she, you know, it was more what I observed. And what I observed was that, um, you know, in business, it's all about relationships. If you're going to get business, you need, you, she always used to talk about this book that uh, is called The Power of Nice. Mm -hmm. And she always used to say, ladies, you must read this book because you get everything that you need if you're nice and if you've got relationships. Mm -hmm. So she then taught me about, you know, going right into business, how we acquire business. And so I was now involved in trying to make sure that we also get the business in. By the time I reported the business, I would have been involved in getting it in as well. And at some point, she even wanted to move me from my portfolio to business development I said no because I didn't feel very comfortable in in living my you know my expert area uh, but you know with hindsight I realized she was just trying to make me all rounded she was trying to go group me uh, probably to even take over uh, from here one day so that experience at Nichols Diamond was the best experience that I had as far as my career is concerned uh, to place me ready for leadership mm. so she modeled she, she modeled a certain type of leadership that impacted on you. So by just leading the way she was leading, um, the, that, that uh, exposed to you um, certain leadership traits. That's Absolutely. what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you have young as uh, you were when you came into the, uh, in, into, the, into the profession, you've gone on to sit on a number of boards. I mean, uh, Securico, Lafarge, uh, FBC Insurance, Olivine Industry. What are the issues that boards are grappling with right now? Okay, so I think at the moment boards are really grappling with compliance. Mm. There's just a lot of things that are changing and changing very fast. And sometimes if you don't have your head up, you can miss on some things. And so just the whole environment of being alert to what new laws they are, being alert to how you're doing your pricing and just making sure that it's adhering uh, to what needs to be adhered to. It's, it's, it's quite a challenge. So you find that certain organizations that never used to invest a lot in compliance departments, uh, in internal audit departments, you know, are having to do that, you know, just so that you make sure that, you know, all, you know, T's are crossed or dots are, uh, or, or I's are dotted mm -hmm. and so on. And um, obviously the issues of, of governance um, are critical, not necessarily because of the season, but they're generally just very important in boards just to make sure that um, your governance structures are facilitative of, of, what, of who you want to be and they are facilitative of productivity and so on. My, my sense is that we, we as a society uh, are generally very good at adhering to good corporate governance. Is that, a, is that a fair assessment in relation to how we compare to, to other countries? Because you do have a global uh, perspective of, this, of these issues. We are, we're compliant in most instances. We make an effort to, be, uh, to have good corporate governance. Is that your sense? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think we have structures that enable us yeah, to right. do that. Uh, so for instance, if, if, if an organization is regulated, you'll find that the regulators are very big on making sure that 
they are the right governing structures. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the Reserve Bank, as they uh, you know uh, monitor the banks, they've got certain requirements that ensures that governance is followed, good mm -hmm. governance is followed. If you go to insurance and pension commissions, the same. If you go to the ZSC, the same. So they ask for certain things that ensures that when you comply, you are definitely also aligned as far as good governance is concerned. But when you go to other places, the regulators are not so much um, big on, on governance issues, though it's something that is, I mean, globally, it's something that is, uh, you know, topical right now, because everything rises and falls on how an organization is governed. And so if you don't focus and invest in that particular aspect, no matter how good your markets are, no matter how good your products are, no matter how good your staffing resources are, if they're not governed, if the leadership is not leading in the right way, in most cases, that's where things crumble. And as the CEO of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe, what, what issues do you deal with on a, on a day-to-day -day basis relating to the industry and, 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 and the profession? Okay, so naturally because we are accountants, our main areas is, is just the de development and promotion of the accounting uh, advisory, the assurance side of things, but we also look at good governance practices. So when, when auditors audit, they are looking at a whole uh, you know, control environment. They are looking at the controls that are in place, including the governance structures that are in place. So usually our impact and our contribution is now to advise on putting the right structures. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the famous management report that auditors do when they finish their audits. That is the report. That way we, 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 we bring value now to the business and say, look, this is what we observed, we think this is it's best that you do it in this manner. And even just the, the qualifications to the, to, to, to the accounts account. itself are a way of also making sure that next time if you want a clean opinion, you have to get these things right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, the opinion is not going to come right. So we do that. But as an institute, we, we run a, a number of continuous professional development courses for accounting practitioners mm -hmm. who are working in this organization so that they are also up to date with things that they need to implement within their organizations. So we run that a lot, and it's not just for our members, it's for the market. Mm -hmm. We also issue guidance papers, uh, you know, when there are complicated standards like the one on inf uh, inflation we were talking about, or the one on exchange rates, we issue guidance papers on how exactly they can go about doing it, mm -hmm. you know, so that, um, you know, they're compliant. So we try to provide as much market information as possible to guide. So if you go to our website, you'll see many technical papers that would have been done. We also run a technical desk, not just for our members, but for anyone. If there's any technical issue from an accounting uh, that you don't understand, that you want to be explained to you, then we also respond uh, through technical guidance mm. and so on. Is, is, is uh, the organization seized with the issue of gender diversity, for instance? Uh, Point number one. Point number two. What's are, are you happy with the pool of talent that is that is that is being produced uh, to service the industry? So gender diversity and the pool of talent. Great. So gender diversity. So um, at the moment, uh, the female members, the female CAZ, about twenty five percent. But um, it's not because there is no equal opportunity into the profession. I think this is one profession that offers equal opportunity. So you find that if you look at uh, the, the firms uh, that train, because firms are the ones that actually do the practical training for, for ICAS, they probably in most cases get more females than, than men. But then what happens is along the way, uh, because of the many roles that the ladies have, uh, you know, when it comes to examinations or completing the training or just balancing training, mm. examinations and things that they have at home. Some fall by the wayside. But uh, over the years, we've seen a significant increase in, in, in the female members. I think 10 years ago, that statistic was probably about 10 to 15 percent. And now we're 25 percent. And as an institute, we deliberately put in place a structure, uh, one we call the Women Chartered Accountants Network, which is there to just help to develop, to profile, to promote the female chartered accountant and right from the student to support them as much as possible, you know, so that they see through the whole process and they qualify. Otherwise, our, 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 insti our, our profession is really um, gender neutral, if I can put it that okay. way. Um, we look, 
a talent. It's talent. Yeah. So if it's a talented lady, it's a talent. And, and it's never about how many ladies we don't have quarters. Mm -hmm. we, personally, I don't like quarters either. Right. I like talent. I like talent to be moved forward, and talent will be there. It's just that sometimes that same talent can fail to get to where they need to get simply because they didn't get the support mm. uh, because of the many roles. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not a, ch a challenge. The numbers are still low. We would naturally want it to ma match the demographics of the country to be 50, 51 or so percent, um, but at 25 percent, I think we're getting there given where we came mm. from. Mm. To tell me, um, you, you, you just surfaced the issue that s most women don't make it through because of uh, the responsibilities that they have. And this is a societal issue, this is a cultural issue. What do you think ought to be done to ensure that uh, uh, the burden that women have uh, is, is not one that uh, limits their becoming professional, being, uh, being chartered accountants? Yeah. So I think one thing that, uh, you know, uh, COVID did and working from home did is that it kind of helped in that women can be in their space, they can still do work and do other things whilst at home, but still deliver on their work front. So I think from an organization's point of view, there is need to ensure that there's some flexibility there. Uh, if you've got talented people, um, you know, don't put them in a box. Just give them the deliverables. Allow them to pick their kids when it's time to pick their kids. Allow them to go off early to go and cook and then pick it up at midnight if they feel they've got time at midnight to finish off what they need to do. So that it's not eight to five you need to be seen, you know, but you just need to deliver the result. So that flexibility then allows women to then be able to, you know, run with all the other roles that they have and still deliver. And women are very, you know, they can multitask, they can do so many things and they will be with the flexibility extended to them, uh, they will be able to do that. And then I think the other thing is just, you know, generally if we start embracing diversity, and start seeing the benefits of having a diverse team, we will realize that we need, um, you know, we, we need the different genders in. Um, it should not be about, you know, complying to a certain law or regulation that we need to have 50% women. I'm just really so ag against those mm. quotas. Mm. But the moment we realize that female leaders actually bring something totally different. They bring empathy there, they bring compassion, something that a leader needs to have if, if they are managing um, people. It's, 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 I'm not saying men are not empathetic, I'm just saying that it's enheightened in women. And so when you have women on the table, I think it's, it makes the balance uh, very, very good. And sometimes our markets are selling mostly to women Maybe you're producing sanitary way, maybe you're producing baby foods. And, 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 and so if you don't have on the table a woman, mm. um, you know, what insights, how where are you going to get the insights? to? Because in any case, say, women make most of the decisions. To purchase. Um, it is important that they, they, be, they, they be around the table. You, I, as I was reading around you, I, f I found something that you said very interesting. And you said, you was, correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, women must not, compete to be like men. They should bring their own set of talents into the workplace. Am I, am I correct? And, and what does that mean? Yes, yes. I always say just embrace who wow. you are, embrace your femininity, because you can never be good at being a man, because you're not a man. Mm. There's a man and they're going to be good at that. Mm. You need to bring what you have to the table. Mm. And like I was saying, the empathy, just just the ability to do many things at the same time. Um, just you, we process things differently, you know, as men and women. And, and, and a, a woman should never try to be like a man in a boardroom, because if they do, uh, they're probably going to shortchange themselves. They probably people are not going to see the value that they bring on the table. But if you're as authentic as possible, you'll find that the value that you bring on the table, simply because of your disposition and simply because of the way that you process things, which is different, mm -hmm. um, it will get you far. Mm -hmm. I, I find that uh, women bring a, a, a different. Um, value addition to the boardroom, to the meeting, because they look at things in a different kind of way. And it's always very important to have them in the, in the room. You are a mother, you are a wife, you are a professional, you are a mentor. Does the word 
work-life balance, the expression work-life balance exists uh, as far as you're concerned. How do you deal with these multiple responsibilities in the workplace and in life? Yeah. I, Trevor, you know, I, I just think that trying to reach a balance can be a fallacy in itself. Mm. I think it's all about prioritizing things that require your attention at a particular point in time. So there are times when you have a big assignment at work right. that's probably going to need you to be in the office up until 10 and up until 11. You do that for that time being. There could be a crisis at home or there could be something that requires your attention at home. You also make sure that you are there at a particular point in time. I think that the balance is reached over a period of time. You can never have a balance today. Just like a will. Sure. At some point, something is on top, something is at the bottom. And what you just need to do is to make sure that your will is turning mm. and you're giving all the aspects of your life some attention at some point to so your career, uh, your home, uh, your faith, and all the other, your health, your body, your, 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 and, and, and your wellness, and so on. You just need to make sure that the will is turning. But it can't balance, unless if it's a flat tire. <laughs> That right. is balancing yeah. most aspects of the time. So I think it's, 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 a, it's a constant mm. state of trying to reach equilibrium, mm. but that you can't quite really reach, mm. but you will be serving it over a period of time. Mm. But I think what's important in all that is support. You can't do it all by yourself. Right. So if it's in the office, get the right people. Uh, get talented people that you can delegate to. If it's at home, get some helpers. Uh, get people that can support you when you can't be at your children's uh, school for sport, for whatever reason. Have someone who chips in and so on and so forth. So it's creating that support network. And have a husband who understands that you work beyond absolutely, 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock. Absolutely, absolutely. I always say this, um, you know, the students, um, the CA students laugh at me, but I always say, Rora na iwe mato. I know that that uh, Tsumo really meant, you know, marry from the same geographical location because you know the family and so on. But for me, I just say just marry somebody who understands your field, who understands your values, who understands your principles so that you never clash when it comes to that. And so I, in our profession, when you're training, you hardly have any time to to do much much else and so you find that a lot of female ca is actually married to a ca uh -huh. and me included because because that is the environment that you're in and they understand you they know that if you're at an audit and you're coming to sleep at four wake up at six to you to, to to go back they understand you mm. they will say good luck mm. but if it was somebody else they'll wonder what is going on mm. you know why are you coming in at That's four and leaving at six yeah. so i always say that to the students and they laugh uh, but it's, it's, it's important to marry people who understand you, who understand the profession and um, who can support you mm. to the greatest extent. I'm not saying they, you know, we should not intermarry within, within professions, but even if you do, mm. just make sure that you find someone who has the same value system as you, who understands uh, what you have to put in uh, for your work. Mm. Let's go now to... Um uh, the, the, the genesis of uh, your journey. Where were you born, okay. raised, right. educated? So I was born in Hartley. Hartley now Chegutu. Chegutu. Yes, so I always, uh, you know, look at my birth certificate and it says Hartley. It doesn't say Chegutu and I'm so proud of it. Um, you know, that it was a beautiful Hartley. So that's where I was born. Uh, but I grew up in Harare. Uh, in a colored community here in Harare. And uh, it, it was such a beautiful setup. Uh, if you know colored communities, they're very close knit. Mm. Uh, most of them are family. So you find the next door is related to the other. We were, we, were, we, were, we were not related to any of those, but they took us as if we were family. So just that whole family environment is where I grew up in. And um, I grew up with my mother because my parents divorced when I was about eight years old. So I grew, up, I grew up with my mother and most of the things that I know and the principles that I have, I took from my mother. And again, um, I always refer to the principles and the values that were instilled in me during that time as my village principles. And I take this from that saying that goes, you can take a man out of a village, but you can't take a village out of a man. I know it was again relating to a geographical yeah. you 
final location. But for me, it's all about the upbringing. That's mm. your village. Mm. Those are your principles. Sure. That's just, so for me, those village principles, no matter where you take me, and if you take me to New York, even if you take me to London, mm -hmm. there are certain principles, mm -hmm. you know, that I grew up with, uh, you know, that you can't take. What are those principles? And in particular, what's the most important thing that your mother uh, imparted to you? Right. So first of all, my faith. Right. We grew up in a Christian home. Uh, you know, what was celebrated in our home was not, uh, you know, material things. We celebrated if someone was baptized. That was a big issue. We would actually invite a few relatives and say they have been baptized. It was a big issue. And even up till now, my mom doesn't celebrate any of our material achievements. But if you tell them your grandson is being baptized, she lightens up. Mm. Those are the things that she cherished. And then she also taught us respect, just respect for other people, mm. respect people, humility. She also taught us that you need to be humble mm. uh, and, 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 and you will be lifted. You, you don't need to lift yourself up. You stay humble and when it's, it's the time is right, um, you'll be re lifted to your rightful place. So those were the principles, you know, that, you know, that made me who I am. Mm. And um, yeah, so even... T tell me, I mean, th those are very important principles. When you look around the society that we are right now, what's your take about those principles, absence or whatever, of those principles. Yeah, the respect one. Um, you know, funny. Just over the weekend, as I was driving in Harare, I was with my mom, and you know, you you come to an intersection where you're supposed to give way to each other, and it's just a, a mess, uh, simply because people don't have respect for the next people pe mm -hmm. person. You know, you just say pass. You know, it doesn't take a lot from you to just let somebody else be or get ahead of you in line, maybe in a supermarket and so on. I don't know what it is about our culture or it, could it be the challenges that we've gone through as a country that has made us a bit hard. Mm -hmm. You know, that softness. is gone. And, uh, yeah, it's, I think so. I think it's dissipating. Just that respect is, is, is not there, is, is, is not there as, as, as it should be. You, you, you've got kids, eh? You've got one, two? Two. two. Yeah. You're imparting those principles that your mom taught you to, to them, I suppose. Yes. And there's hope that uh, we might get back to normal settings. Definitely hope is there. There's right. always hope. There's right. always hope. I think for as long as we invest in what we want to see, there's definitely hope. So I will do my part with my own children, and I'm sure the next parent mm -hmm. will do their part, and hopefully we'll be able to get back those. Uh, so it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, I mean there are pockets of, sure. of, of places where people are respectful, you know, where people, you know, are humble enough, uh, you know, to be able to, you know, listen to somebody else's views without feeling like they know best and so on but I think we need to do it in the home charity begins yeah. in the home yeah. so if you don't do it with your own children um, then we when we are not contributing to the future a society is built a family at a time isn't a family it family at a time yeah and and so you went to um, uh, St. David's High Bonda uh, talk to me about that, 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 yes, that experience yes. and yes. then went to the Rhodes University um, you, your education journey, as it were. Yes, so uh, St. David's Bonda, or we just like to call it Bonda, that's how, that's how we like it. It's a girl's eye, and it's a girl's eye that you used to just take the brilliant kids. So it will take only four points, or wow. back then when it was two points, only two points. So it was a congregation of girls who were so bright. We were so, so bright that even though you were bright, maybe at your primary school, when you get to that place, you realize there are people who are brighter than you. And uh, because it was a mission school, we were also raised in, with Christian principles. Mm. Um, you know, you go to church, you pray. Um, but I think the greatest takeaway from that particular school was just it molded me into a very confident girl. That's why I never pushed the gender card because when you had a girl's eye, there's, there's no, you don't think about those things. It's just talent. Mm. It's just who is the next person and how good are they at, at, at school and what they're doing. You never have to worry about the boys and the girls. I then went to a high school um, in Chinoy right. where there were, there were boys, and, and, but it was very easy for what, me. What there. school was that? 
Chinoy High Chino School. High, okay. Yes, uh, and um, now suddenly I, we had, you know, boys in the class. But because of where I'd come from, I actually didn't see the boys. <laughs> I didn't Poor see boys. them. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see them. I right. just saw people and I just saw talent. Right. So I think that's what girls I can do to, 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 to the young ladies. It can give them the confidence that, you know what, you are enough. Mm. You've got everything that it takes, no matter who else comes around you. Uh, it builds you into that. So that's what Bonda did. And, and we always joke and we say, Bonda girls have cut that, that, <laughs> cut that cutting edge. Right. Uh, and it comes from that. I mean, we, we had an, a, an amazing headmaster during our time. It was called Mr. Shindawanyika. I think anyone who passed through Bonda during those times, you know, this man is, 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 is now late, but he did a, a lot. I, I always say to myself, what is it about Bonda? Because the, 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 the people that passed through Bonda are so proud of the, play, of the place. What, what is it? You know, I, I think it's, um, it's probably, it's, first of all, it's the principles they are bringing, mm. the things that you're taught. Right. Um, you know, you do your own work. There are no workers at the school, or at least at that time. So everyone, you get to school, you're allocated a duty. You have to do it at a certain time. Uh, after that, you go for prayers. After that, you go to school, you know, into class. You, the routine was mm. amazing. It was not military routine, but it was done with love. The sisters, you know, with such love that you don't actually realize you're doing so much. Mm. It's only now when we reflect back and we say, wow, we literally did everything. At, in agriculture, we grew our own vegetables, right. you know. We would peel our own potatoes for our meals. But all of this was done in such a way. Trained you. Trained. Grounded you. Grounded. Gave you certain principles. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just being around, you know, sharp minds is amazing. Mm. Because it was the cream. It was, it was the cream, you know, of, of, of the cream. Mm. And so just being around sharp minds meant that your conversations were rich. Uh, your discussions were rich, and, and, and yeah, that's why that's how we got Kadat. Mm, Kadat. Yeah. <laughs> and then you went to Rhodes uh, University yes. um, to do your, your accounting. Tell me, I'm always fascinated by the decision. Why did you choose accounting, mm -hmm. not history, not geography? Right. So, Trevor, for me, um, you know, I chose um, this profession when I was about 15. And uh, the reason why I chose this, I, I was looking for a rewarding career. Mm. Yeah, I was looking rewarding for a rewarding career. Yes, rewarding. You're, you're already looking for. I was looking for a rewarding career mm. because, um, you know, I always saw how my mom, because my mom would literally share a payslip with five of us and say, look, this is what I earned. She was a nurse. And uh, uni school fees, uni school fees, uni school. I don't have enough for you to buy new shoes or I don't have enough for you to get uh, new clothes and so on. And I always used to say when I grow up, I want to help my mom. Mm. When I grow up, I want to help my mom so that that pay slip, you know, we have more to share. And so, uh, you know, my processing was I need something that is rewarding. I need so it. mom's condition influenced you to say, I want to make a change. I want to yes. get a job that's going to be enable me to, to help her. Help yes. Um, I wouldn't put it so much as, as, as condition, mm. uh, Trevor, but I think it's, it was just some of the aspirations that I wished I mm. had when mm. I was younger because I didn't have the luxuries, you know, of life. Yeah. And um, I, 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 I always wanted to do it for my mother more than myself because she worked so hard and she made sure we were in school, we had everything that we needed. And one of the things that I always said was, my mom must have a car. Mm -hmm. My mom must have, she must not die without having driven a car. So I must get a job that makes sure that we are able to get a car. Did, have and, you been able to buy oh, a car? Oh, definitely, oh, definitely, definitely. Well we were able to do that, yeah. Well so, so that's how I chose accounting. I mm -hmm. just felt it, and, and, and it didn't But disappoint. you also had the skill, you had the brain to do accounting. I, I wouldn't I have brain. chosen accounting because it would have been disaster. <laughs> <laughs> no, I certainly had the brains, but I also was very hardworking, especially yeah. in university. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, my, my classmates actually used to call me CCG. It's so funny uh, because I was just that one girl that, you know, yeah, I know what I came here for. You know, I was doing my books. So the lecturers loved me absolutely. And I was very clear that I wanted to be a CA, so everything that I did, 
uh, was was such that you know so I always top of class at Rhodes University. At Rhodes University, because Rhodes University is also known for uh, a lot of hard drinking and hard oh, yeah. playing. But Sis yes. G kept it straight. Sis G kept it straight. <laughs> Sis G kept it straight even in that environment. But but it was a beautiful environment. And and um, one of the my biggest takeaways was the network as well. Because I think from a very young age, my mom taught me that it's important to know people, have relationships. You never know. Uh, you know, one day you're going to need somebody, or they're going to need you. Just just know people. When mm -hmm. when you, it's never a coincidence when you meet somebody. So when I was there, because there was there were many nationalities there. I always made sure that I have friends from this place and that place. And I've kept those friends even wow. to this day. Yeah, so that's one thing that, yeah, you know, I, 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 I achieved and I attained from, from roles other than the academic. Mm. Yeah. You, you're very big on relationships, Gloria. Um, professional relationships, uh, relationships within, within, within society. It, it, it's, it's, it's not easy starting and maintaining a relationship. It requires... Uh, persistent attention and investment. Talk to me about why you think relationships are so important. Yeah, so relationships uh, need somebody who's loyal. That's number one. And patience. Mm. For one to be loyal, you need to be patient. Why? Because people err. You know, there will always be things that they would do to you uh, and you just, you know, dump that friendship or that relationship. But for me, um, I, I've got friendships that go 20, 25 years, even just service providers. People will do my hair, people will do my nails. They, uh, they go 20 years plus, not because they didn't do anything that upset me along the way, but just that patience. You know, just patience to know they are human. Mm. You know, I'm probably human as well. I I, I err, mm. and I would want somebody to to forgive me and give me another chance. So that's what you know keeps relationships together. I've got friends who are 30 years. We've been 30 years, my friends, and so on. Not because they have not done, you know, or I have, no, not because they haven't disappointed no, you. No, disappoints yeah. disappointments will always be there, but just to understand that they are human and that you have to go over that and. Um, that's what's important in life. And then you then did a master in business leadership with UNISA. You did a, you have a master of laws from uh, the University of Cambria. What's been the driving force right. to get all this education? Right. So, you know, I just love investing in myself. I'm, I'm, I, I get very curious you know, about a subject matter, and I just want to get to know a little bit more about it. Uh, when I worked in insurance, um, I actually even did the insurance uh, qualification up to diploma level, because I never want to be around a table and then be said, no, but they, these ones, they don't really know about it. I want to be in the conversation, even though it's basic, mm -hmm. I want to be able to ask the right questions. I want to be able to understand because I've got a basic knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I'm, I'm just very curious. I'm, all rounded, more or less. I want to be, I, I like to be all rounded. So the MBL did that for me, certainly, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. on the leadership. But the, the LLM in international business law was the most amazing. Um, because this is, this is now a d totally different discipline, it's law. And, um, you know, it just, it opened up my mind to a world, a, a totally different world of things that I didn't know about. And uh, there you were thinking you're a CA, you know, you know, most you know it things. all. You know it all. No, I realized that no, no, there's so much more, you know, to be learned. And, and also because it was an international, um, you know, program, I, I got to meet top lawyers from, it was mostly, or most of them were from Europe, top lawyers from Europe with different ways of thinking and different perspectives mm. that no one can take that away from you. Mm. And, and so when I look at contracts, yeah, and, and that lawyers have drawn up. I know what to ask them. Wow. And sometimes I challenge them to the extent that they say, Madam, are you a lawyer? I said, no, I'm not a lawyer, but I do understand, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your legal jargon, and I do understand what we are trying to achieve, and this is not achieving what mm -hmm. we are trying to achieve. So I just like to be disposed like that. I don't want to feel like there's an area, you know, that I don't at least know the basics of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you are very passionate about mentoring. Um, actually, having been uh, uh, selected to be part of the Global Women Mentoring Program, and you've been mentored by Kathleen Murphy, uh, based in the in the U.S., I want you to help 
the viewers understand. I mean, we talk about mentoring all the time. I'm passionate about mentoring myself, having benefited from it and having seen the difference that it makes to, to young people. What's the ideal way of mentoring and being mentored? Okay, so I think the starting point for a productive mentorship relationship is the mentee understanding and knowing what they want. Because a mentor is just making themselves available to you to learn. But the mentee needs to know what they want. So what I've seen in most relationships is that the mentee will simply say, can you be my mentor? But they've got absolutely no idea what they want to hear from you, what they want to learn from you. So I think for me, it starts with, you know, defining yourself as a person. Mm -hmm. Define yourself, define what you have, define where you want to go, and define the gap. Once you've defined that gap, and you then approach Trevor and say, Trevor, can you please mentor me? I think these are some of the weaknesses that I have, or these are some of the gaps that I need to fill to get me to the next level. It makes it easy for Trevor now to mentor. So most mentorship relationships then do not do so well because it's not clearly defined. And as a mentor, I can't do that for you. You have to know what you want. I can only perhaps guide you to say, why don't you look at it this way and you tell me the areas that you want me to, to work. And by the way, you, Gloria cannot be an all-round mentor for, 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 for a young girl. She, they can get something from me, but they must get something else from the next person because not everyone has everything that somebody needs. So that's why you find, for me, I have many mentors. Some who know that they are my mentors, some they don't know. I just, they just mentor me from afar. And your, your con these conversations are one such. It's a mentorship platform if you look at it. Oh, it's a you. leadership mentorship platform because when someone is sitting there and they're looking at a doctor or an accountant and, and oh, oh, an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and they want to be like them, they're busy taking notes. Mm -hmm. They're listening. So that's what it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's about... There, there's a, you've touched on something which um, I identify with, which is there's a misunderstanding sometimes on the part of the men and the mentee. Um, can you mentor me? Do you actually understand what that means? Uh, and also, you can look at somebody and say, um, I think they need mentorship. But unless they raise up the hand and say they want mentorship and they know exactly what they want, um, will they be able to, to be helped? Am I? Am I? Absolutely. I th that's what I think, Trevor. Yeah. I just think that for someone to be assisted, they must know that they've got an issue that need, they need assistance with. So if someone needs assistance in communication, but if they feel that they are good, you're not going to crack them. Mm. But if they realize that they've got a gap, then they'll be able to work with you and say, I need to close this particular mm. gap. We can do this over this period of time and we'll check again how you're doing. Mm. That's, I, I believe that's, that's what great mentorship should be. Who is mentor? Who are your mentors? Um, and who, who have you been mentoring? Who are your mentors to start off with? Okay, so I've, I've, I've many, <laughs> many mentors. Yeah, I can single out the yeah. few. Ka Kathleen, Grace, is, Radzika, Kathleen, Kathleen is definitely yeah. one of them. There's Emilia Chisango. Emilia Chisango is probably a mentor to a lot of our, our you female. You the second lady who sat here and men mentioned her name. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. She is a trailblazer. So she broke a number of glass ceilings for us in, in, in the accounting profession. Mm -hmm. First of all, she was the first first female black partner in the big four firms. Mm. Something that had never been done, she did it. She was also the first uh, female president of our institute. And our institute is 103 years old. When she became president, it was about 90 or so years old. It had never you know, been presided over by a woman. Mm. So she, she's one of those that in the accounting, you know, or at least in our profession, mm. was a trailblazer. So I, I, I worked with it, KPMG, but besides that, even outside, I just, I watch her, mm -hmm. whether from afar, from a close range over a T, but I watch. So sometimes I don't even, my mentors are not, you know, we don't have a structured way and I don't knock and say, can you be my mentor? No, I simply ask for a coffee and a tea and I bring my subjects that I want to right. learn. The next time I do the same and I pick as much as possible from those people. I've also been mentored by uh, Dr. Charity Jr. Uh, at a time when I was making the change from uh, corporate into, into, into ICAS. And so she, she really sobered and balanced me and made me really make my decision, you know, from a very unemotional, you know, point of view. Yeah, so those are the ones that I can single out. But so many, including men, 
I worked with great, great men. At First Mutual Life, I worked with a very intelligent man called Ruben Jara. Mm -hmm. Yes, and actually your background. And if you have a boss such as that, you are kept on your toes mm. because he knows the numbers from his head. He will tell you on page so and so there is this. And you are the person who's prepared this report and you don't remember. So it's, it's people like that. So they get you to a certain standard of excellence, um, you know. So yeah, so many people, mm. so many so people. In interesting, like I said, 18 years in the industry and 14 of those in an executive position. I want to push you now to be vulnerable. Have you ever failed, first thing? And, and secondly, could you pick for us two or three of your failures and share with us what those failures taught you? Great, yeah, sure. Fa failure I have definitely, Trevor, I think many times. But maybe the one that I can single out was because it was the one that hurt me the most. Uh, you know, during um, my qualification journey as I was writing my final, final qualifying examination because I was a top student in university and I came here and I passed my, you know, I was just cruising through until that last juncture and then I failed. My lecturers at Rhodes were watching, they even called me on the day of the, can you imagine, wow. so many years later they were still tracking me and they saw me, I failed. The results are put on websites and so on. They were looking for that little girl who wanted to be a CA and I failed, so I felt like I failed a lot of people. You know, I, it was just devastating mm. for me. And uh, you needed to wait a whole year before you can write So you the set exam out again. a whole year. Set out a whole year. But you know what it taught me? Mm -hmm. It taught me humility. Mm. Perhaps I was going to be pompous that, you know, I, I got this thing. You know, I'm just cruising. Mm. But it, it settled me. Mm. You know, it made me sit down and reflect and when I then studied for the year uh, to, to, to rewrite this exam, I was a different person. Mm. I was approaching the books, you know, differently. With a bit of respect. I was respecting <laughs> these books before right. I thought I, 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 I had it all. So I think that, that failure, I think it changed a lot of mm. things in me. And so the way that I approached things after that was respect the things, yeah. you know, as, as they come to you and uh, apply yourself um, and learn and um, patience as well. Because waiting for a whole year, when your peers are already CAs, yeah. and you have to wait for a whole year. That's to humbling, again. that. That's humbling. Um, and which other failure in the workspace? And not so much in the works. Okay, in the workspace space, I could say that um, when I uh, joined First Mutual, it was not. Uh, it was an error, you know, that I made. Mm. And this error, you know, could have easily, um, you know, destroyed destroyed my career. It was an error in that. You know, I put my signature on things that I didn't really, really, you know, read and understood what they meant. And they got me in trouble. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, because of who I am, a, 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 you know, a child of God, I think God just protected me. It was, it was bad. Mm. Um, but I learned from it. And because I learned from it, and that was the year that I actually got my promotion. Uh, to, 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 to lead, uh, to be um, the finance executive of the biggest uh, unit in the group. But it was from a mistake. Mm. I'd done things uh, without really fully reflecting. And ever since that time, Trevor, I do not put my, or even an initial, or even witness something that I haven't read. Mm. I read everything before, before I Before you put your, your signature, yes. so you learn something from learn that. Something you say you are a child of God. Uh, a lot of people s look at professionals and, and they think, you know, somebody successful like you, a chartered accountant, a lawyer, um, is, is, is Christianity a superstition? Talk to me about the importance of God and your faith as a professional person and particularly within the workspace. Trevor, the way that I see this, professional or professional, everyone needs a source. So you need to define who your source is because you're not self-sufficient. There is a greater power. 
there's a greater power. So you need to define, you know, which, what is your source? Right. What is that one source that is going to ground you? And for me, it's, 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 it's being a Christian, it's my faith. Others might look to other things as the Bible said, mm. some trust in chariots and horses. I choose uh, to trust in what has worked for me. Um, and so it's, it's not about, you know, being a professional or not, or that, uh, you, know, you know, standing on your faith is for certain type of people, no. The Bible doesn't do doesn't demarcate people to say, look, if you're a, if you're you know a professional and you've done well, then you don't need. There's absolutely no one who doesn't need a greater power. Mm. And at some point, you you will realize that you need it. You know, I always say sometimes that um, I look at people who don't believe in God, who have no faith, and I say, how do they get through life? Yeah. Because I would it's never be able to survive a day without difficult. without God. Yeah. I think it's just difficult. I, I, I also don't understand, um, but I think it's, but I, I, I also think that there's a time for everything. Mm. You know, there's a season for everything. Um, they will come a time yeah. uh, that they will realize. Mm. Yeah. You, you said that um, the, within the profession, there's about, women are account for about 25% of uh, uh, chartered account accountants. I've had this conversation with, um, uh, uh, other women that have come onto the onto the platform. You look at the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. There's only, I think, at the moment, two women CEOs: Cheludo uh, Lovu at Edgas, uh, Precious Nika uh, at Lafage. Why this discrepancy? Out of something like sixty-something companies, there's only two women. Is this a societal issue? Is it an issue with uh, the gender? Speak to me about that. Okay, first of all, let me give you hope and say we are coming. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, we are coming. I think we were, we were at, you know, we are coming from a point where not many women were in leadership, mm -hmm. even just in management. But they are coming along the way. Mm -hmm. But what is important is for people to realize what they bring to the table. So what I found in most boards was that, you know, uh, they'll say we need a woman because we need to, we need to have a balance on our board. There's too many men, so we need, we need uh, one or two women. But I think the mistake that they made mm. was that when they chose those women that they put on the boards, they really showed themselves that they, they're bringing talent to the table and that they've got what it takes to be there. And so you find that more boards are actually getting much more women, you know, over and above the quota, at least the ones that, you know, that I know are very progressive. And there are certain men who have been very instrumental in promoting women. And I need to mention this one. I'm sorry, but I didn't share this with him before. But I need to single out KK, Kumbirai Katsande. If you track everywhere that he's been either a chairman mm -hmm. or on the board, usually there's a lady at the mm -hmm. top. He just believes in talent. That's what he does. He's at Lafarge, he's the chair there. He was at Nestle, there's a lady there. He, he, he looks at talent. Mm. And even you can see the way he chairs boards, the way he, he listens to views. Kumbira Kansande is an amazing, is amazing uh, human being. I mean, he sat there and uh, his, his, uh, that show is perhaps one of the most popular shows that we've had. He's an amazing human being. We're blessed, we're blessed to have uh, somebody like him. Uh, uh, Talk to me now, have you ever had instances where you were treated in a manner that got you to think I'm being treated like this because I'm a woman in the workspace? No. Why? Why do you think so? No. Um, well, first of all, I think, Trevor, a, a great part of my, um, a great part of my working life, I worked under, under a woman. Ah, right. So 10 years. <laughs> Uh, of my prime, I worked under a woman, so there was never a time that I felt mm. I needed to. So I was privileged, but I certainly know that uh, th this is just my story. A lot of many other stories that are different from mm. mine, mm. but uh, you know, I can I cannot fabricate that I, I, I've ever felt discriminated because I've, I was a woman because of just even when I was at first major, I was one of the youngest, one of the few ladies, but the the men that were there were respectful. Mm. They were respectful of talent. They were respectful of women, and uh, they would put you ahead of, of 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 men, even if if you are if you know of the same sort of talent and merit. Mm -hmm. So I've been fortunate 
I've been fortunate. I, I cannot say that mm, I felt that prejudice. Who is, who is the one person that has had, or rather few people that have had the biggest impact on you, on who you've become? So my mom, definitely. I mean, my mother, because of the, the village is principles. Is she still alive? She's, she's still, still very alive. much alive. She must yes. be a proud mother. She must be. I think so. But like I said, my mom doesn't celebrate certain things. Yeah, you she, said that. Yeah. 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 She, her celebratables are very different from many people That's and they are always aligned to her values. Mm -hmm. um, so I could tell her I was on conversation with Trevor. She would just say, oh, okay. And then she asked us the same thing. So what did you say about, uh, you know, that Bible verse? She, she quickly changes <laughs> right. to what she values. Yeah. But that's her. That's and then she's made uh, you know, a great, great, great impact uh, on my life. Uh, my husband, of course, I mean, is a great man. I've been married to him for 20 years now. And uh, I've never seen anyone as selfless as mm. he is and as supportive mm. as him. I've never once felt that, you know, I'm, I'm detained or I'm restrained from doing this because of my husband. He's always the one that, Support that supports me. He's an amazing, amazing, amazing support. Um, t tell me, the, the, um, you, you said you're a very curious person, always you know, learning. What, what, what's, what's grabbing your attention right now? You've done law, you've done insurance, you are a chartered accountant. What's drawing your attention right now? Right, so I've just finished an executive development program that I did for about five weeks. Amazing um, uh, program. It's even a free program. So you know people don't look at these free, free programs mm. easily. Um, first of all, uh, when we went into lockdown, Harvard University was offering some free programs and some free courses. People saw that, but I think they, they ignored it. And, and I looked at it and, and I did one of the courses. And from that course, I was then introduced to somebody else who was running an executive development program that was focused on Christian principles. It was mind-blowing and it was amazing and I've been recommending and recommending everybody to to go on this course it just you know um, once a week uh, at 8 p.m. at night for an hour you connect into uh, you know your lesson and you learn a lot and, but you know so it's not so much that I'll be learning new things uh, you know out of this executive but I think it's more about when you get something being emphasized and when you hear it being said from a different angle, confirmation confirmation and also also from a different angle it just makes it you know mm. even more important for you to do and I've also been thinking of psychology business That's psychology yeah because I also think that uh, leaders you know you you you, you leaders are uh, you manage people yeah. what are people people are human beings with, with certain behaviors and for you to be able to lead well you need to also to understand, understand the them. psychology yeah. So. You, you, I admire you because you're very good at something that I'm terrible with, which is procrastination. You have this uh, mantra, just do it. Um, I was saying to my therapist the other day, but how do I do it if I'm not ready, if I'm scared? And she said to me, just do it. It's, on, it's when you do it that you deal with the issue of failure. Talk to me about how you got to that uh, mantra of, just, just do, do it. it. Mm. Okay, so pro procrastination is, is, you don't find it in my vocabulary for as long as it's something that I want to do. Mm. So before I do things, Trevor, trust me, I would have processed them for a long time before. I would have planned it. So they will be already in my plan. I want to do this when I get to this age. I want to do this. So when I get there, I must do it. What am I waiting for? Mm. Because it's something just that I... Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Uh, so when I get there, I'm, I'm not thinking twice about so it. So you're very organized. I am extremely organized. Mm. I have plans for when I'm 50, what exactly what I want to, what exactly I want to see and get when I'm 50. When, when I got to 40, I knew exactly what I wanted. And when I was 30, I knew exactly 25, I've got... I've so it's got, all written I've down. I've got strategy documents wow. of my That's life. That's interesting. On you my know, birthdays, I, I, I sit and I review my strategy. That's oh, what I do. That's well, it's, when it comes to that, I'm, more, I'm almost like you. Okay. Because I've got a, a personal uh, mission statement that I review every year. I'm not very big at... Uh, uh, New Year's resolutions because I think that's that's or a fad that doesn't go very far. So that's interesting. That, mm. So that discipline has has rewarded you clearly. Mm, 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 mm. Absolutely. And Absolutely. tell me, is there anything that you battle with? 
Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I okay. It's 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 so I I I like to be a creature of habits. Uh -huh. I like getting into habits, and I'll explain a bit more when I talk about the books that have influenced me. And there are certain things that I try so hard to do and I fail. One of them, I've always wanted to be a 5 a.m. clubber. I want to wake up at 5 a.m. every day, but when it comes to winter, I just can't do it. And sometimes it's so frustrating for me because I really want to do this. I want to get up, I want to exercise, I want to meditate well before I get into the office. But I just struggle with getting out of bed. That's uh, and, and, but, but the desire is there and I keep trying. Um, yeah, there's so many other small little things as well. That has uh, the 5am reading the 5am club book has that helped it at, at all? It is, it yeah. is, it is. But uh, I know exactly what I need to do. Is just I can't it's do just, it. So you, that's it's one thing a, that you just can't do. I, I in some some yeah. when it's summer, I do. I can. So, but when it starts getting cold like it is now, I just can't get myself out of bed. Yeah, that's where I think I I'm, I I'm, I must say I'm, I'm one up on you. I am very disciplined when it comes to that. I actually get up at 4.30 um, uh, every day during the week. In winter, I get up at 4.45. Wow. I give myself an additional uh, 15 minutes. It's, it's, uh, that's one thing that I just, just do it. I need like lessons it. from you. <laughs> I need lessons. <laughs> Tell me, if I asked you, how do you explain your success? What is the thing that you think explains your success? First of all, I think um, um, I think destiny. Aha. I just think that that is the will. God's God purpose for, my life. for you. God's yeah. will for you. Purpose. I just feel that I'm where I am, and I've travelled all the places I've travelled simply because I needed to be mm -hmm. in those places. Mm -hmm. That's number one. But secondly, like I said, because I plan everything, I think I had, um, you know. I, oh, I, I wanted, I've always wanted to be on, on this conversation. <laughs> All right. <Okay>. But um, <laughs> I, 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 probably I was going to put it much, uh, much later. And the day that you then saw me and say, uh, you know, I want you on the conversation. I actually then text my friend and said, yeah, then it's happened. It's happened. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get onto that I, conversation. That sounds like. I just process it before. Yeah. And I make sure that it starts happening. And you know what, Trevor? The mind is powerful. Yeah. The moment you feed something into your mind, trust me, if you are, if you are preoccupied with it, it will, it will materialize. A lot of things in my life have happened that way. I just preoccupy my mind with it. This is where I want to go. What do I need to Meditate do? Meditate on it. What do I need to do? Yeah. Do what I need to do and I'll get it there. Happen. Yeah. We, we, you know, I've just finished reading for the second time, The Power of Now. Um, amazing, yes, amazing book, and yeah. I've always, like you, believed that um, it's what we give to the world that comes back to us, and that our thoughts have that power to to influence things to come to us for as long as we give to to the to the world. So, yes, I think the universe conspires. And the, that's the it expression. Does. That's it the expression. That's the expression. It conspires. The moment you release it out there, it's going to come it comes back. back to you. It comes back. So if you release negativity as well, mm. ch chances are. That's why you say if you think you're going to fail, you're probably going to fail. fail. If you think you're going to succeed, you're probably going to succeed. Gloria, we've already gotten onto books. <laughs>
back in 20, 2006 when I, you know, I did, I, I did an executive development program with him. And that habit never left me. And so I actually belong to a book club. And this year, our target is to read 52 books. I'm on 21, so I'm falling wow. behind. I'm falling behind, um, you know, but, but also I get bored. So if a, a book is not, is you not, put it I, aside. I, yeah, I, I don't need to complete yeah, it. So yeah. if it's halfway, I put it on the side. But these six books mm. are the ones that have inspired me. And when you, if, if I just tell you about these books, you would know, you know everything. Let's about go through them. It. The first one, this is the Holy Bible. All right. The Holy Bible. And I want to sing well, just one verse for you. Matthew 5 verse 16. It says, shine your light so that men can see your good works and give the glory to your Father in heaven. For me, that's my standard of excellence. May he be glorified. That's May my standard glorified. of excellence. And, and so whatever I do must be excellent enough to shine and to make men stop and say, oh, glory to, mm. to her God. And he's watching all the time. Yes. Mm. Then there's this one, Trevor, the monk who sold his Ferrari. Mm. Uh, by Robin Sharma. I read it many, 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 many years ago. And what this book did to me is that it taught me that life is not about material things. Material things are great. Mm. I don't mind driving a Ferrari, <laughs> like, like this, this particular top lawyer drove a red Ferrari, mm, mm. but they gave it up to go and stay with monks so that they can understand what life is all about. And life is about investing in your mind, in your body, and in your soul. So that's when I learned the exercise of eating well, the ex exercising, just exercising yeah. my body and being, you know, being well, relationships, the importance of. Mm, I learned fantastic. from this book. Good. Who will cry when you die? It ah. says it for itself. Mm, it's that's just, Robin Sharma again. That's Robin Sharma again. Yeah. Who's going to cry when you die? When, when you die, Trevor, people are not going to talk about the cars that you had. They're not going to talk about, you know, um, the houses that you built. They're not going to talk about the things that you acquired. They're going to talk about the things that you gave, the impact that you made. Mm -hmm. So this book simply says, think about it. Mm -hmm. What do you want that to be for you? So and that's why we're here, isn't it? That's why we're, we're created. What impact are you going to, to, to have on, on those that are around you? The next one? The next one, The Greatest Salesman in the World. Mm -hmm. This one is an amazing little book. I'm not a salesman, but all this does is that in your craft, mm -hmm. whatever it is that you do, be the greatest. Mm -hmm. If you're an accountant, be a top accountant. If you're a lawyer, be a top lawyer. And how do you do it? Hard work, commitment, perseverance. You will fall, uh, you know, things will come, they will pass. That's what this little book does. It's in the form of a story, but amazing little book. Awesome. Standard awesome. of excellence. Thank you for sharing. George richest, Klassen, yeah. Yes, the richest wow. man in Babylon. I'm an accountant, so I naturally expect that I'm financially savvy even with my own finances. But it did not been for this book. I'll probably be a good steward of other people's money, but perhaps not my personal monies. But this book taught me about saving, uh, you know, taught me about putting aside money for a rainy day, taught me about giving to things that don't necessarily benefit you because those things will multiply and will come back to it's you. It's an amazing book. It's an amazing book that uh, I, I've read once, but I'll be revisiting from yeah. time to time. Yeah. And the yes. last book? The last one is called Half Time. Mm. This book I was gifted when I turned 40 by a very close friend of mine. And this talks about moving from success to significance. Mm. So it says by the time you get to 40, chances are you're halfway. You're successful. In your life, you've yeah. probably done half your time. If you're going to live to 80 or maybe 70, you've probably halfway. Mm. So you need to reflect and say, okay, so what is my next half of my life going to be like? Success, the first half you were chasing that. You learned, you earned, and now when you're moving to the next half of your life, you need to return. Mm. You need to move into significance. Success is about yourself and maybe your family. What is it that we're getting? What are we, and then significance is now about others. Mm -hmm. How you influence, how you impart, how you're returning, maybe the talents and all those things that you're given. That's my power six. Wow. I'm sure there'll be power 10 soon <laughs> as I come across more books that uh, impact on me. Fantastic. What a, what a, what a life, uh, uh, Gloria, uh, like I said, 18 years in the industry. And, and I do get a sense that, uh, you know, uh, after ICAS, there's something big 
uh, that's going to come. I, I know we talked about fashion uh, off, <laughs> off air. I know I, I gather somewhere that uh, fashion is something uh, that we ought to look out uh, as far as you're, you're concerned. An inspirational story uh, that I have no doubt is going to be inspirational to a lot, lot of uh, uh, people out there. Uh, the girl child, uh, the boys and girls out there. Um, Gloria, thank you so much for creating the time to share your inspirational story. Allow me now, Gloria, to tend to our viewers who are in Zimbabwe, who are on the continent and all over the world who follow this show and have made it the success that it has become. We are a weekly show. We come out on Mondays at 7 a.m. Central African time. Uh, to ensure that you don't miss out on any of these quality uh, conversations, please click on this red button and you get an alert every time we have one of these quality converse conversations. We've gone a step further. Scroll down below this video and you'll find uh, a link to a post podcast. Click there for your listening pleasure. Until next time, thank you so much and cheers to you all. <music>